السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد قال الله تعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفمن كان مؤمنا كمن كان فاسقا لا يستوون أما الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فلهم جنات المأوى نزلا بما كانوا يعملون وأما الذين فسقوا فمأواهم النار صدق الله صدق الله العظيم حميدا ومصليا متوكلا على الله وبعد Respected brothers, elders, and sisters in Islam, we thank and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tremendously for blessing us and gracing us with this opportunity to come today on this blessed and sacred day of Jumu'ah to perform our salat of Jumu'ah. I hope and pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our coming and may Allah reward us both in dunya and in akhirah. Our life on earth is pretty much like a coin. You can spend it any way you wish, but you can only spend it once. The choices of spending it are many, innumerable, but the opportunity is once. You can analyze life in a thousand ways in your mind and in your theory. You can run your imagination and you can imagine life from all different perspectives, from all different directions. But you can only live life forward. You cannot live life backward. Whatever is gone is gone. As it says, the past is history. The future is mystery. And the present is a gift. So as human being, we can only live life forward going forward there is a beautiful saying in english a well spent day brings a good night sleep a well spent day if you spend your day very good in doing good things then it gives you what a good night sleep and a well spent life brings you a pleasant death a well spent life brings you what a pleasant death otherwise we will spend today regretting what we did yesterday and we will spend tomorrow regretting what we did today you know we live in a time where a dead cell phone battery causes us more panic, more stress, and more anxiety than a dead heart. What did I say? We are living in a time and an era that a dead cell phone battery, you're traveling and your cell phone battery dies upon you, then this causes you more panic. It causes you more stress and anxiety than your heart that cannot take any effect of any good that dies. Alama ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, a great scholar of the past, he says, 
A believer never fears death of his soul. We all know that we will die one day. This is decree by Allah. Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut. Everyone will die one day. So a believer never fears the death of his soul. But what he fears, he fears the death of his heart. He should fear what? The death of his heart. Because one is in his control and the other one is not. The death of our soul, this is in the hands of Allah. وَمَا كَانَ لِنَفْسٍ أَن تَمُوتَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ That's in the hands of Allah. We don't have control over that. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees our time to leave, we will go, we have to go. But this heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in our bodies the utilization of this heart in the proper manner this is in our control you know today i would like to speak about two different types of lives and four different categories of people who lives on earth two different types of life and four categories of people that are existing and living on earth today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with intellect, intelligence, and understanding to choose from the two different types of lives as to which one we would prefer to live. That's number one. We have understanding, we have intellect, we have comprehension. We can choose from the two different types of life that we would prefer to live and from the four categories of people that we would want to belong into which category would we want to belong in which of the four ibn hajar al-asqalani rahmatullahi alayhi a great scholar of the past who has written the commentary of sahih al-bukhari he makes mention of a riwayah, a narration from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in which he says that the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Allah has given every person four gems. Allah has given us four gems. And I'm not talking about gemstones here. I'm not talking about emeralds and pearls and rubies and so on. I'm not talking about that. Characteristics. Allah has given every human being four gems. And they are also four things that removes the effects of these four gems. There are four things that will remove the effects of them. The first gem that Allah has given us, what is it? Aql, intelligence, understanding. The second gem is deen. Allah has given us this deen, this beautiful deen, this complete, perfect way of life that Allah has chosen for us. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. A choice given to us by Allah, this deen, this beautiful deen of ours. The third gem that we were given is الحياة, shyness. Modesty, morality, integrity. And the fourth is A'malu Salihat. Good deeds, righteousness. Inna Ladina Amanu wa Amilu Salihat. Now these are these these are the four gems that we are given. I'm gonna say them again. What is number one? Aqal, intelligence. Number two, deen. This deen that Allah has given us. Number three, haya, shyness, modesty. And number four, good works, a'mal, salihat. And there are four things that removes the effects of these four. Number one, al-ghadab, anger. Anger removes the intellect. You know when a person gets angry, you would often hear him or her saying, I don't even know what I'm saying or what I have said. 
or what I have done because you do first then think you don't think first then do you think you would act first then you think and you should be thinking first then act but in a in a fist of anger a person don't think he only acts because your aql stop thinking your mind and your brain stop thinking number one you know it is said that a moment of patience in times of anger will save you 100 moments of regret later on wow a moment of patience sabr rethink what i'm going to do a moment of patience in the time of anger haste this will save you 100 moments of regrets later on number two the second thing that removes the effect of these gems hasad jealousy envy we are envious of people's achievements in life we cannot see progress in someone else's life it needles us it bothers us why him and not me why his family and why not mine this really bothers me and what this does to you it it shaves your deen away it takes away your deen rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says iyyaka wal hasad fa inna al hasada ya'kul al hasanat kama ta'kul al nar al hatab be mindful and beware of envious feelings towards someone else because this will remove the effects of your deen like fire burns up wood it will remove it dangerous third is shahwa desire ego this removes the effect of haya morality is undoubtedly frightening but it reminds us that we are living with a purpose of life morality reminds that us that in the time and age that we are living in immorality and indecency is prevalent and someone of morality is frowned upon and someone of immorality is looked up upon is looked up upon so what removes haya rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says a very frightening hadith he said al haya wal iman qurana haya modesty morality decency and iman goes hand in hand they are intertwined idha dhahab al wahid when one leaves then what happens wow the other follows when one leaves the other follows so if morality goes from a person's life and immorality steps in there is a fear that after a while his iman also will leave because they move together al haya wal iman qurana they go together number 4 Number four, ghibah, backbiting. What this does, it takes away our a'malu salihat. The hard earned good that we strive so hard on a daily basis to earn, ghibah, backbiting, slandering, completely removes the effects of it. Sayyidina Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyallahu anhu, a great sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked the Nabi of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, what type of iman is the best? What was his question? What type of iman? Where is iman? In the heart of a person. Al-iman waqara fil qalb. What type of iman is the best? What do you think was the, was the answer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Did you think the Nabi of Allah said that the best iman of a person is the one who prays 
regularly and fast regularly and, and do hajj and so on. That is a displace. MashaAllah, all well and good. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Hub fillah. Love. Appreciate others for the sake of Allah. In spite of creed, nationality, race, whatever. Love, show compassion. Show compassion. Love to others. For whom? Lillah. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned something else. He said, And this tongue that you have, use it. What was the question? What is the best iman, right? What is the best type of iman? Rasulullah is now making tafsir and he's saying, One sign of the best iman of a person is to use this tongue for the dhikr of Allah. For the remembrance of Allah. Not to abuse people, not to insult people, not to use this tongue like a grass knife that cuts everything in its path. Like a lawnmower or a weed whacker that cuts everything in its path. This tongue, be careful. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, what's next? What is the next best type of iman? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that you love for his people what you desire for yourself. You love for people what you desire for yourself. I think I mentioned this story before, but I will mention it again. Imam Hassan Basri, rahmatullahi alayhi, a great scholar of the past, great scholar. He was a tabi'i. He learned from Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha and many other sahaba. Hassan Basri rahmatullahi alayhi. One day he happened to know that someone was speaking ill of him. Someone was speaking ill of him. So he called one of his students and he said, come. He had a tray of sweet meat, sweet halwa. He said, take this sweet meat and give it to this person. Go and give it to this person. The student went and he gave it to the person who was what? Speaking ill of him. Speaking ill of Hassan Basri. He said, what is this? Where did this come from? Who sent it? He said, Hassan Basri sent this to you. And he sent a message also thanking you. Thanking you. Why thanking me? He said, you have just given him all of your deeds. You have just given him all of your deeds by speaking ill of him. So in, in, in showing appreciation, he sent halwa for you. <laughs> he sent what? Sweets for you. So this is what we do. We hard earn deeds. Hard earn. And we strive so hard for. So it destroys our a'mal salihat You know, how, how serious is this? I'm going to mention one more incident. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Wow, the, the two greatest people that ever lived on earth after Anbiya. Greatest people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. You know, he said all the eight gates of Jannah will be calling out his name on the day of Qiyamah for him to enter through them into Jannah. While we will be struggling and thinking let one gate call my name. I just want one out of the eight to call my name to enter through it. His accolades are tremendous. I don't want to get into it. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu, they had this servant that used to cook for them in a journey. Whenever they would go in this journey, this, this servant would cook for them. One day this servant without cooking was very tired because of the journey and fell asleep. The servant fell asleep. Both of them were in the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The gathering was over. They are hungry. Then now they are going for food. They approached the servant and saw him sleeping, napping. Right? And they said, look at him. Look at him. He is sleeping. He is always sleeping. That's all they say. Is that a bad statement? Just look at him. He is sleeping. 
After saying that, they woke him up. After mentioning that, they woke him up. And they said, we don't have any food. Can you go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask him to give us some food? We are hungry. The servant went to the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Umar and Abu Bakr, they want some food. Do you have anything? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, go back and tell them they have already eaten. Go back and tell them they have already eaten. So they went, the servant, he did not know. He went back and he said, this is the message of the Nabi of Allah that you have already eaten. They did not eat anything. They were hungry. So both of them decided to approach the Nabi of Allah. Ya Rasulullah, we haven't eaten and you, have, you said that we have eaten. Rasulullah said, yes. Your brother who was sleeping, what did you say about him? You have backbitten him. That's your crime. That's your sin. You have already eaten. You have what? You have already eaten. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua for us. May Allah forgive us. Rasulullah Sassam said, Yes, I will make dua, but you also need to go to the person and ask him for forgiveness. You also need to what? Go to the person and ask him for forgiveness. So the two types of life that I'm talking about. One is a life of desire here in this world. A life of ego. A life of want. And one is a life of obedience to Allah. One is a life of compliance and obedience to Allah. And the other type of life is a life of disobedience to Allah. Ego, shahawat. You name it. A person who chooses, who chooses, remember you have a choice as I've mentioned before. A person who chooses to live a life of desire in this world, then he or she will be forced to accept a life of obedience in Akhirah. He or she will have to obey Allah in Akhirah. Whatever Allah will decree for them will happen in Akhirah. Understand that. Whether adab, punishment, or whatever is the decree of Allah. And a person who chooses to live a life of compliance and obedience to Allah in this world, for him in Akhirah will be a life of desires and satisfaction. <coughs> Akhirah for him, desire and satisfaction. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدْعُونَ نُزُولًا مِّنْ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ So understand the difference. You choose a life of obedience and compliance here, in Akhirah will be a life of desire and satisfaction. A person chooses a life of disobedience to Allah, shahwa, desire, and so on here. In Akhirah you'll be forced to, to obey what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says for us. Allah tells us in the Qur'an, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَىٰ أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَىٰ Have you seen the one who has made his desire to his slave? That we are, we are enslaved to our own nafs. We are enslaved. A person who takes his desire as his Rabb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions so beautifully in the Qur'an about these two categories of people. أَفَمَنْ كَانَ مُؤْمِنًا كَمَنْ كَانَ فَاسِقًا لَا يَسْتَوُونَ لَا يَسْتَوُونَ أَفَمَنْ كَانَ مُؤْمِنًا One who chooses a life of compliance and obedience. On the other hand, one who chooses a life of disobedience. They cannot be equal. لَا يَسْتَوُونَ So Allah now is saying, what will be the result of the obedient people? فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ those who choose a life of obedience, فَلَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ الْمَأْوَىٰ For them will be Jannah in Akhirah. Those who choose a life of not obeying Allah, وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فَسَقُوا وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فَسَقُوا فَمَأْوَاهُمُ النَّارِ What will be their place in Akhirah? Nar, fire, Jahannam. كُلَّمَا أَرَادُوا أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا أُعِيدُوا فِيهَا Every time they would want to come out, they will be told to get back in. You know, when we do something wrong, 
We blame shaitan. Right? Isn't that so? Shaitan made me do this. Or shaitan made me do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran also, فَأَنْسَاهُ الشَّيْطَانِ ذِكْرَ رَبِّهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word Rabb here, Rabb here for Yusuf alayhi salam. How can you use the word Rabb? People have problems to you when you use the word Mawlana. Right? Don't know what, what, the, what the context. Allah is using Rabb here for Yusuf alayhi salam. Right? Good. So, فَأَنْسَاهُ ذِكْرَ رَبِّهِ The incident with Yusuf alayhi salam when he was in prison and he interpreted the dream of, of the person and he was released. Yusuf alayhi salam told him, make sure you mention me in the presence of, your, of the king. But the shaitan made him forget. فَأَنْسَاهُ shaitan. So when, shaita, when we do something wrong, we blame what? Shaitan. But when shaitan did something wrong, who did he blame? Who did he blame? Who did shaitan blame? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him to prostrate before Adam, when the command came to prostrate before Adam, فَسَجَدَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ The angels prostrated illa Iblis. Shaitan refused. Shaitan refused. So, what made him refuse to prostrate? What, who made him committed that sin for not prostrating? Ulama and scholars have mentioned it was his ego. It was his nafs. It was his desire. That ultimate made the devil became the devil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Dawood alayhi salam, a king of the time, La تَتَّبِعُ الْهَوَىٰ فَيُضِلَّ عَلَيْكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ Don't follow your desire in, in, in judgment, for you will be, فَيُضِلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ For the injection of this will what? Will take you away from making the right decision. Right? It's a recipe of disaster. And if a person succumb to this ego, then the regrets of it will be irreversible. Irreversible. What is the result of someone who does not succumb to that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in the Quran, فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى One who fear the standing before Allah on the day of Qiyamah. وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ That I will have to stand before Allah. You will have to stand before Allah. We all have this consciousness while living that we will have to stand alone before Allah for accountability. There is accountability here on earth and also accountability in Akhirah. This is, the, this is the only thing that, that, that is twice. Accountability. Right? One who fears that and protects himself from a life of disobedience. فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Then Jannah will be his abode. So those are the two lives. What are the four categories now? The first category are those people who makes no effort on themselves nor on others. You don't think about consequences of actions. You make, you live a carefree life. I will think when it happens tomorrow. I don't care. So I am not making an effort on myself to be better, nor I am thinking about other people. That's the first category. The second category are those people who would make effort only on others and forget about themselves they would not think about themselves others i want this person to be good i want that person to be good i will try my best for this to happen humanitarian service all are well and good you think about others you think about humanity but at the same time you're forgetting yourself you're not making an effort to make yourself better that's the second category of people. The third category of people are those who only make effort on themselves and forget others. They forget others. They don't care about others. My salah, my deen, my zakat, 
Me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I. Me, me, me. I pray is fine. I give zakat is fine. I fast is fine. It's only me. I only care about myself. I don't care about the other person. I just don't care. This is the third category of people. You think about yourself alone, you disregard others. The fourth category are those who think about themselves as well as others. You think about yourself, you want to be better in life, and at the same time, you will make effort on others. This is the category we all should strive to be in. That we think about ourselves, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in many places in the Quran. For example, Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu qu anfusakum. O you who believe, save yourselves. Did Allah stop there? Did Allah stop there? No. The ayat continue. Wa ahlikum nara. And your family, all the people, all the people. Yourself, all the people. What Allah says in another, another ayah. Wa man ahsanu qawlam mimman da'a ila Allah. Mimman da'a ila Allah. Did Allah stop there? Wa man ahsanu qawla. The best of speech is that person's speech who what? Calls towards Allah. Who are you calling towards Allah? Other people, right? Making effort on other people. But did Allah stop there? No. Then Allah say, Wa amila saliha. You call people towards Allah, but at the same time, you do good deeds. You yourself. You know, very typical example if you are flying and the, the, the air pressure in an aircraft drops, but you will hear the announcement. What is it? When the oxygen uh, mask comes up, comes out, what do you hear? Hey, put on yours first, then somebody else's, right? Isn't that what you're being told? Make sure you put on your oxygen mask, mask first and then put on the other person's mask. This shows care for yourself and others. Care for yourself and others. And when I speak here of others, I'm speaking generally broad based. I'm going to mention one incident. This is mind blowing. A Sahabi by the name of Abu Dujana, radiallahu anhu. Very great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam participated in every campaign even the last hajj of, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he used to pray behind the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam what a privilege what a privilege praying behind Rasulullah every salah he used to pray behind the Nabi of Allah but as soon as the salah finishes salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah he would leave the prayer hall he would leave the masjid very quickly and go home what he would do he would leave very quickly and go home the nabi of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam observed him on a few occasions and one day rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after salah he stopped him and asked him oh abu dujana remember the accolades of this sahabi he's a badri sahabi he's a badri sahabi his jannah is already for him Allah says about the people of Badr, do whatever you like, Jannah is yours. And every Sahabi is also a Jannati. But hear what Rasulullah is telling him. Oh Abu Dujana, don't you have any need that you would like to present before Allah? You don't have any need in life? Abu Dujana, he said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I cannot live without the blessings of Allah, even for the blink of an eye. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Okay, if you have needs, then why don't you stay back after the salah, make dua, and present your needs before Allah? You leave very quickly. You have needs, make dua. This tell you dua after salah, right? <laughs> right? Make dua after salah, present your needs before Allah, and then you can go. So he's explaining himself. Abu Dujana now is explaining himself why he would leave quickly. He says, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have a Jewish neighbor. I have a Jewish neighbor who has a date palm tree and some of the branches of that tree is in my yard, in my courtyard. And when the wind would blow in the night, 
dates would fall from those branches into my yard. So I would leave right away after Salah so that I can pick up those dates that fall in my yard and collect them together and return it to the owner before my kids wake up and start eating them. Subhanallah. See that? He would leave. Why? To pick up the dates of the neighbor. Right? You know what we say? What is in my yard is mine. <laughs> Right? What is in my yard is mine. That's not so. That's not so. So he would leave quickly just to pick up the dates to return it to his neighbor. Why? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't want my kids to wake up and eat, start eating the dates without permission. Without permission. And he said, one day I was a little late and one my son had already put a date in his mouth and he was chewing it so i had to put my finger in his throat to make him vomit it to make him vomit it and i said to him how many of us will say this to our children he said i said to my son are you not ashamed that you will be standing in front of allah on the day of qiyamah as a thief are you not ashamed that you will stand before allah on the day of qiyamah as a thief He's telling his son that. Look how cautious they were. What is not mine is not mine. Doesn't belong to me. Not even for my children. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was sitting there. And he overheard this conversation of Abu, Juda, Abu Dujana explaining to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he went to this Jewish neighbor. And he purchased that date palm tree. He purchased it and he said, Oh Abu Dujana, this is a gift for you and your children. You don't have to worry anymore. This is a gift for you and your children. That was not all. When the Jewish neighbor heard of this, what Abu Dujana used to do, he had never known before. When he heard of this, he was moved. He was moved and he came with his family. This Jewish neighbor came with his family in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I am ready to accept Islam with my entire family. This is how Sahaba lived and this is how they spread Islam by their actions. They were advocate of deen because Islam was in their heart. Let me ask you and ask myself, are we advocates of this deen? Are we advocates of this deen? We should be, right? Islam, you know, we don't need to give da'wah to non-Muslims, really. We don't need to give da'wah to non-Muslims. Non-Muslims should see Islam in our lives and be impressed by us. But is this happening today? Wallahi, this is not happening today in my life nor in your life. People are seeing the opposite of Islam in our lives and running away from deen. Don't even want to hear about Islam and Muslims because of the actions of Muslims today. Huh? Because of the actions of Muslims today. How do, we, how do I carry myself? Huh? How do I present myself out there in, in an open environment? Am I an advocate of deen? Let me ask myself that. Allah will ask me in the day of Qiyamah. Nabi, I'm an ummati of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Huh? What deen was reflecting in my life or no? This is what we have to worry. So we have to put ourselves in that fourth category. <coughs> think about ourselves and think about others. How others can be good. How we can be a source of benefit for people. How this can happen. How that can happen. I wanted to mention one or two more stories but there is no time. Right? But we have to one choose one of the two lives and choose this fourth category. Unfortunately, many of us are thinking about ourselves alone. We don't think about others. To heck with the world. I don't care. It's about me. Me, myself, and I. You know the word ego? You know the word ego? How it is spelled? E-G-O, right? E-G-O is ego. You remove the E and what, what remains? Go. So we got to go. We got to be in the move. We got to keep on the go. Right? This is what we have to do as Muslims so that the world can see us differently, inshallah. And this will come through my actions and your actions. Alhamdulillah, Before I close, 